Wow, what a crowd. Well, I tell you, today I'm going to speak more from my heart than my words. There has never been a time in my life that my brother has not been in my heart or my thoughts. We talk nearly every day, either by phone or text or email. If there was one word that I could use to describe Mickey, it would be advocate. He's been an advocate his entire life. His first advocacy job was handed to him at the age of two and a half. I can remember dad assigning him the toughest job that he may have in his entire life as far as being an advocate, and that was to take care of me. Mickey and I did not grow up in a traditional childhood setting. And when my dad would come and visit us, he would place Mickey on one knee and me on the other, and he would talk to Mickey and say something like this. Listen, son, our situation is as it is. There's nothing can be done about it. You must make the best of it. Now, you have a responsibility. You have to take care of your younger brother. I always get uh, touched up right about there. And I tell you, he always has. Mickey went on when we went to school, high school, middle school, grade school. Mickey was popular. Everybody liked Mickey. And, he, and, and all the students, if anything, anybody needed anything, they would go to Mickey. And he was a leader in student government. Mickey went on to college, Brigham Young University, where he got involved there uh, in a leadership role in student politics, more getting involved in politics in general, where he was a member of the Young Republican Party. <laughs> Couldn't help myself, Mick, sorry. I, I thought Sean would like that. But while at Brigham Young, he applied for an internship in Washington, DC. And something would happen that would change his life. He became an intern at NEA. Now, Mickey never forgets the things that have helped him. And so later when he went into business, he never forgot the internship experience. And he has had 15 interns from the Hinckley Institute, the University of Utah. Now, I believe some of those interns are here in this room. Would you please stand if you were an intern for Mickey? Here, here. Perfect, here, outstanding, outstanding. Mickey went on to become a, a teacher and he was again an advocate for students and teachers as he took a position with NEA and then went to work at the uh, NEA and became an advocate for students and teachers again. And then on to the White House, where he became an advocate to cities and states. Worked with Mayor Corradini on, the, on uh, the gateway, making sure that it was cleaned up in a Brownsville project. With Rocky Anderson, working with things having to do with the 2002 Winter Olympics and trying to figure out a way to get light rail funded. And then on to the University of Utah, which they were after 11 acres from Fort Douglas and getting that turned over to the University of Utah. Jobs that many said could not be done. Mickey Barr got done. And then I remember as he left the White House, started talking about his what next and decided to go in business. Some 17 years later, He's still in business, going strong, an advocate to his clients in Washington, D.C. And now, the, now here at the Latino Leaders Network, an advocate for us, our community. 
bringing us together to tell our stories that are powerful. If there was a one quote that would sum up my brother, I, I, would, I would use and alter it just a little bit from George Bernard Shaw. Some look at things that are and say why. Mickey Barra dreams of things that never were and says, why not? Without further ado, I'd like to introduce my brother, the Honorable Mickey Ibarra. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, of course, that would bring a tear to anybody's eye. Who says you can't come home again? Thank you, David. You know, no one on earth, David, has ever had a better brother than you have been to me. And I will always be grateful. I also want to thank everyone in this room for showing up. 80% of success in life is just showing up. And I'm glad you're here. And it's so wonderful to be joined by so many friends and special guests like former mayors Ralph Becker and Rocky Anderson. Glad you're here too, Kate. And uh, Mayor Bennett McAdams, who was here with us earlier, and to have the Attorney General of the State of Utah, Sean Reyes, with us. What an accomplishment, and so delighted that you were with us, Sean. I want to thank everyone for showing up. And to Janet, you know, Janet, your leadership of our community is so important during these very challenging times. You know, having served with Janet in the White House, I'll tell you this, I always want her in my foxhole. <laughs> also, I want to thank Maria Teresa Kumar of Voto Latino. Now, for agreeing to be the master of ceremony. She restructured her entire vacation schedule where she would have been overseas today to make it here to be with us. And I really appreciate your, your leadership and your contribution. I also want to thank uh, Jose Enriquez of Latinos in Action. Isn't he an impressive young man? <laughs> really, thank you. Now, I've prepared remarks. If I do this right, it's going to last about 20 minutes. We pride ourselves in starting on time, ending on time, respecting everybody's time. And this event is scheduled to end at 2 o'clock. I prepared my remarks to share my story, to give an overview of the Latino Leaders Network, and to introduce our new book, thanks to Zions, who's made it possible for each of you to have a copy of the book. But first, my story. You know, I was an assistant to the President of the United States and Director of the White House Office of Intergovernmental Affairs before I ever mustered enough courage to share my story. President Bill Clinton showed me the way by sharing his story often. Some of you in the room may recall. He did this by introducing himself to the American people through a video, The Man from Hope. It's still available on YouTube, The Man from Hope. Now, this method had never been used before in presidential campaigns. And it proved to be a very effective platform for sharing his story. My experience at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue 
for nearly four years, observing reactions of those to President Clinton's story triggered my desire to help others by sharing mine. Our stories are powerful and they need to be told. When we do, it gives others confidence, motivation, inspiration, and hope that they too can succeed. You know, only in America could a Mexican kid from Salt Lake City, Utah, who grew up in Utah foster care, end up being a witness to history, working alongside the President of the United States. And 32 years after arriving in Washington, I still feel a great deal of gratitude for the lessons learned from many who helped me along the way, including a number of you right here in this room. My father, Francisco Nicolás Santiago Ibarra, is a Zapotec Indian. This is his favorite part of the program. <laughs> a Zapotec Indian who came to this country as a bracero from Oaxaca, Mexico in 1945. His first job was picking fruit in Spanish Fork, Utah. He eventually left the fields and landed a job at Kennecott Copper Mine, a member of the demolition crew. It was a union job, better pay, benefits, and job security. And I'm so delighted that we've been joined by Frank Jocklick also, a former CEO of Kennecott Copper Mine. Frank, thank you for being here. <laughs> So how about that? We got the guy down in the demolition hole, and we've got the guy at the top of the company right here in the same room. I love that. I love that. Now, Dad met and married my mother, who was much younger, white, and Mormon. In the early 1950s in Salt Lake City, that was not a socially acceptable thing to do. By the time I was two years old, the predictable happened. My parents divorced. And soon after, my mother, who was 18 years old, relinquished custody of my younger brother David and me to the Children's Service Society of Utah. We were placed together in foster care. Now, the Children's Sur Service Society of Utah has two folks in this room. Where are they? I met the executive director early, and Becky, stand up, would you? <laughs> How about that? A little aside, only recently, about, uh, I guess it's been maybe a, a year now, one of my University of Utah interns, and with the help of Mayor McAdams, I think Emma Houston's in the, in the room also, one of his able staff, found the records of Mickey and David Ibarra in foster care. It confirmed a lot of what we thought we knew filled in some of the blanks, and there were a couple of surprises. But I'm grateful to the Children's Service Society of Utah and all of they have done and continue to do to help children that need our help. 
Now, for most of the first 15 years of my life, we were without a traditional family, as David mentioned. As kids, we both wondered about who we were and why we were alone. And we coped with our experience very differently. It's fascinating how we can be from the same parents and be so different. Of course, it's impossible for me to share my story without sharing much about David. Our stories are inextricably linked. I was the peacemaker and negotiator with a lot to say and always feeling a responsibility to help David make it. Now, despite my best efforts, David withdrew. He was extremely shy, afraid, and so angry. He would not talk. Can you imagine David Ibarra? <laughs> would not talk. I literally spoke with him spoke for him, rather. His teachers at elementary school, grades you know, one through three, would come and get me out of class when he was acting up to settle him down. He'd often go to the restroom, hide in those stalls, and wouldn't come out until I came and got him out. Now, when I was six years old, we briefly reunited with my dad after he remarried and was allowed to take custody of us once again. However, his marriage failed and we were right back in foster care. Although very fortunate because of Isla and Cecil Smith of Provo, Utah, a white Mormon family who cared for us for more than seven years outside of the Utah foster care system. This was a favor and a request made by my dad. Now, even as a boy, I talked too much, but otherwise was doing fine in school. I got along with everybody, yet my brother continued to struggle. This was when I first recall experiencing the impact of skin color. David, who was a shade darker than me, was confronted with discrimination and racism frequently. David was resentful about our life in foster care. Often people would ask David the simple yet hurtful question, well, if your name is Ibera, that's what, it, that's what they called us, Ibera, why are you living with the Smiths? It caused David to fight back with his fists. The same person never asked that question twice. <laughs> but it dragged David deeper and deeper into trouble. Fortuitously, during the summer of 1966, our father invited us to come and visit him in Sacramento. I was 15 years old, David was 14. By this time, Dad had used his GI Bill, enrolled in college here in Utah, the Hollywood Beauty College, became a hairstylist, left Utah, opened his dream, his own business, the Mona Lisa House of Beauty. <laughs> How's that for a job change, Frank? <laughs> now, during that vacation in Sacramento with our dad, David pleaded with dad constantly to let us 
come live with him. Dad was single, a hairstylist, his old business. He had it going on. Believe me, the last thing he was looking for was to have a 15 and 14 year old show up. But he agreed. He agreed with one condition. We could not split up. We had never been split up in foster care, and he wasn't going to allow us to be split up now. So whatever we decided, we had to do it together. I wasn't so sure about leaving Utah. I had just completed my freshman year at an elite, private, four-year high school. Thanks to the intervention of my foster mother, sports were of supreme importance to me. I mean, I had made the varsity baseball team and the junior varsity football team as a ninth grader. But in the end, I knew David wasn't going to make it in Utah. And so we decided to, re to reunite with Dad in Sacramento. Our foster parents in Provo were very disappointed. They thought we were making the biggest mistake of our lifetime. But they realized it was our mistake to make. We packed and shipped all of our belongings by mail. Got a bus ticket and off we went to Sacramento in August of 1966. There are a few crossroads I recall that truly changed my life. The decision to leave Utah, reunite with my father, was a game changer for both David and I. Doing so gave us the opportunity to gain self-awareness and helped us find the identity missing in our lives. We weren't Ibera anymore. We had the opportunity to spend time with our father and learn from him. I have never been around a harder working man in my life or anyone who is more proud of his Mexican and Indian heritage. We were able to meet our family and become more familiar with Mexican culture. It was an amazing and positive experience that for the first time gave us a sense of belonging. The biggest change was how many Latinos lived in Sacramento <laughs> and how much more casual California was about race and ethnicity. We felt immediately more comfortable about our identity. It helped set us on a path to leadership. That path started for me with sports and then continued as senior class president, being, mo being voted most likely to succeed. And David joined me as junior class president at Luther Burbank Senior High in Sacramento. <laughs> and we've been joined by another wonderful friend of ours, Fernando Arroyo, who was also a mighty titan. <laughs> Thank you. Now, since my early years in Utah and California, I've experienced many professional leadership opportunities, as David mentioned, a teacher, a union organizer, a White House official, a small business owner, and now chair of the Latino Leaders Network. And the common thread for me is I am an advocate by profession. Now, like reuniting with my dad in Sacramento, my experience advocating for President Clinton at the White House was another pivotal crossroads in my life. President Clinton taught me a very valuable lesson, that winning is about addition and multiplication. Losing is about subtraction and division. I always try to win by addition and multiplication. Contrary to what you may witness from some in Washington today, 
That is still the best leadership formula for success in politics and in life. Let me transition to the Latino Leaders Network. I realized as we exited the White House on the final day in 2001, it was going to be important for me to figure out how to continue the conversation with so many leaders that I'd come to respect during my time at the White House. Nearly four years with a West Wing office made it possible for me to meet with literally hundreds of elected officials, Latino leaders, terrific leaders from coast to coast. The White House offered a unique platform that most showed up for when invited. Founding the Latino Leaders Network was in part a strategy for creating a platform to keep making a difference in our community. It embraced a simple yet difficult mission, and that is bringing leaders together. So what we did is organize two signature programs, one of, one, you're, one of which you're at, the Latino Leaders Luncheon Series, and we also have a tribute to mayor, mayors twice a year during the summer and winter meetings of the United States Conference of Mayors. The Luncheon Series is an opportunity to provide a leader the chance to share their story, and it has worked in a very, very successful way. We honor leaders from all walks of life, government, sports, entertainment, journalism, academia, and much more. We honor a broad section, broad cross section of our community from Cubans, Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, Dominicans. We come from a lot of places and we have a lot of leaders that deserve the recognition. To borrow a former campaign slogan, we believe we are stronger together. Since 2004, the Latino Leaders Network has convened 50 luncheon events and 27 tributes honoring leaders in front of over 11,000 guests. Now to our book. Our book, Latino Leaders Speak, Personal Stories of Struggle and Triumph, which you all have a copy of now, was published last month by Arte Publico Press at the University of Houston. It, it includes 33 co keynote addresses delivered at the Latino Leaders Luncheon Series since 2004. We, as an organization, wanted to share these powerful stories with everyone. The reality is our community has role models. We have heroes and we have outstanding leaders. And at this time in our country's history, it's so important for us to share those stories. I hold this little book up, I wish I had one here, this little book up and say, this is the truth. This is the truth. And don't let anybody tell you different. It is the truth. These stories will inspire young and old on their path to success. We have so much to celebrate, so much to learn from each other. And now for the first time, we have these 33 stories wrapped in a single volume. Now, in my earlier book, Mickeyisms, 30 Tips for Success, I call attention to the most powerful word in the English language. And it only has three letters. Does anybody know what it is? I haven't heard it yet. The most powerful word is ask. A-S-K. Ask. And now I am going to ask each of you, everyone in this room, to help us ensure that our new book is accessible to everyone, especially our youth. How do we do that? Please ask every book buyer to purchase this book for school libraries, city libraries, county libraries, state libraries, 
Ask. Ask. And while asking doesn't guarantee success, it greatly enhances your chances. Ask. We have so much to celebrate and so much to learn from each other. It is my hope that this book will inspire all readers to dream big, get prepared, and get ready to lead. To conclude, let me take you back to my story. David and I are often asked, how in the world did you overcome so many obstacles to achieve success? First, we reject the notion and the label that we are disadvantaged. You know, in an unconventional way, our early experiences in life may have been the makings of our future success in overcoming the challenges we both confronted. Consider this, in the words of John Roberts, the current Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, who re recently offered in remarks to his son's ninth grade graduation ceremony, Being treated unfairly can give you a commitment to justice. Suffering betrayal teaches you a lot about loyalty. Being lonely helps you value friendship all the more. Having bad luck from time to time will make you conscious of the role chance plays in life. And you'll understand that your success is not completely deserved. And that the failure of others is not completely deserved either. And finally, pain. Pain can cause you to learn compassion. So there you have it. My story, the Latino Leaders Network, and our new book. I love Salt Lake City and the state of Utah. And please remember this, everyone in the room, if it happened to me, it can happen to you. Always, always remember to dream big. Thank you. Thank you. Nikki, I, I want to take this moment actually to address the young people in the room. Very rarely in our journeys are we able to see people who shatter the glass ceiling for everyone else. You've created not only a community here in Salt Lake City, but across the country. And for those young people, the fact that you're already in this room means that you have a lot of responsibility to pay it forward. Mickey Ibarra, David Ibarra are an example of what our community needs. Thank you so much, Mickey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.